welcome to our audience listening on WGAU in Athens and streaming live at WGAURadio.com. Candidates form this evening from the third floor auditorium of Piedmont Athens Regional Medical Center, Prince Avenue. Still, if you're in the neighborhood, time for you to drop by and join us in attendance. Otherwise, thank you for listening in this evening. I'm Tim Bryant, going to be your moderator for the next 90 minutes. This forum featuring the incumbent district attorney, first term incumbent, Deborah Gonzalez, and challenger, Kaki Yalamanchili. Audience, please welcome the candidates who have taken time out this evening. Special thanks to a couple of people who have made this evening, this broadcast, this event possible. The organizers, Athens Classic Inc., Steve Middlebrooks et al. Thanks to Michael Burnett, CEO of Piedmont Athens Regional Medical Center, our host, and Elaine Cook at Piedmont Athens Regional Medical Center for doing a fine job facilitating the event this evening. <laughs> thanks to our program sponsor, that would be CEH Rating, CEH Rating, presenting the live broadcast of this event. I have said in anticipation of this event, I've been covering local politics in Athens for more than a quarter century now. In terms of attention on a local race, this may top them all, the number of people who have expressed an interest, we'll say, in the outcome of this contest. By way of the format this evening, very, very loose format, uh, I will serve as both moderator and timekeeper, which means I'm not going to pay much attention to the time. We'll ask the candidates to respect uh, the time as I impose it and say that it's time to yield the mic to the other candidate. Very broadly speaking, very loosely speaking, two minutes for opening statements at the end of the evening, which will come 90 minutes, now less than 90 minutes. We'll have two minutes for closing statements from each of the candidates. We'll toss questions to the candidates. Loosely speaking again, one minute for the candidate who receives the question to answer the question, and a similar amount of time for the candidate who will rebut or offer uh, another view on the question that was posed to the initial candidate. With all that said, we will get started with opening statements. We had a draw earlier, Conky Yall and Chile, the independent candidate and challenger. He goes first, two minutes, Conky Yall and Chile for your opening statement with a caveat. I'm sure you have something prepared. I want to throw you both a curveball. Use a portion of your opening statement to say something positive, something nice about your opponent. And with that, copy off of you in two minutes. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Piedmont uh, for hosting us. And I'll just open the top with something nice. You know, this is our third candidate forum, I think, in a three week period, which is more than you see. A uh, two-week period, the three weeks leading up to the election, but yeah, two-week period. Uh, time is a flat circle, it feels like right now. But uh, I appreciate Ms. Gonzalez's willingness to engage in these forums and to be out in front of voters talking about these issues. So I appreciate that, uh, and I know all of you appreciate that, so thank you for being here. My name's Kalki Almanchili. I'm running as an independent candidate to be your next district attorney because I believe in a DA's office that is a place for public service, not a place to divide people based on partisan politics. I believe in a district attorney's office and have the vision and the plan to build a district attorney's office that's committed to delivering justice for victims, especially in the most serious violent felony cases, connecting people who need help, who have uh, committed nonviolent crimes with resources to help them better their lives and giving our young people good relationships that can help them make better decisions and make good decisions. And I don't just have a vision. I have a plan and the experience and training to execute on that plan. And I've spent my entire career doing criminal justice work. I've spent half of it as a prosecutor, successfully trying every kind of case from a DUI to a murder. And I spent the other half as a criminal defense attorney, including representing people that because of their financial circumstances have appointed counsel and can't hire private counsel. And I believe firmly by having practiced law in this circuit for so long, that we are moving backwards in all of these important areas. We're moving backwards in the area of delivering justice for victims in serious violent felonies. We are moving backward in the area of connecting people with resources to help them due to a misunderstanding of how the DA's office can steer cases 
towards our accountability courts. And we, you know, but Jimmy, you'll have plenty of time to okay. amplify any number of those points moving forward, but I'm afraid the two minutes for the opening statement have expired. So two minutes now for District Attorney Deborah Gonzalez. And again, the reminder, something nice about Kakiyala and Chile in those two minutes. Yes, thank you. Good evening to everyone. I just want to say thank you to you for being here. This is our third time that we're getting together. Every audience has been different, but it's so important to have these conversations. So if I have not seen you before, I have not met you before, thank you for being here because these uh, conversations are really important. And I agree um, with Kaki that both of us being able to say we are going to be there for the community, that we are both going to answer questions, I think is really essential because for many years we haven't had that when it comes to candidate forums. Usually half of this table is empty, so I just want to give kudos to Kaki for doing that as well. But I am Deborah Gonzalez. I am the elected official uh, district attorney for the Western Judicial Circuit, which encompasses both Athens, Clark, and Oconee counties. I was elected four years ago on a vision that the way that we approach justice needed to be changed. And it was that vision that got me elected because that's what the community, the majority of the community, voted for. Um, as everyone knows, when you're trying to change a system that has been inbreded and, and has suppressed black, brown, and poor people for generations, it is very messy and it is very difficult. And it requires us to look at things very differently. And if we're going to have a different approach to justice, that means that the office itself is going to look very different. It's not going to be the same that it was before. Um, and I came in in a very, I sort of say, a perfect storm. We were in COVID. We were getting over a judicial emergency for 18 months. We were in the middle of a change of 14 different DA offices that changed leadership, including the face of many of those DAs. So for the first time, you had eight women of color DAs, and that really did change the face of justice as we move forward. So I'm proud to be here with you today to talk about my record, to set some things straight, to clarify some things, um, and to really have a good conversation moving forward. So again, I just want to thank all of you, thank Piedmont for hosting this, the Athens Classic Group for putting this together and recognizing that we needed a forum like this, so thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah Gonzalez. The first question will go to you as District okay. Attorney, so hang on to the microphone. Again, loosely, very loosely, one minute in which to respond. And I'll, as moderator, I'll, I'll exercise my authority as a benevolent dictator and expand that time. Uh, that time frame from time to time. But the question and deals with an event that came down, I guess, just yesterday. The Georgia Supreme Court ruling uh, against your claim of uh, immunity to open records requests in, in certain cases. Uh, I want to get your reaction and then copy out and Chile yours to that Supreme Court ruling. Yes, yeah, so thank you for that. Actually, I think it came up today because okay. that was when uh, I noticed. But things go very, very quickly here. Um, that lawsuit went forward because of a series of overwhelming, harassing requests, open records requests that were made to my office, 60 of them in 30 days, two a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, like clockwork. Each of these um, open records requests was requesting a little bit of something. The last one was to see if I had any communication with Fonnie Willis and her supposed person who was in an affair with her, Nathan Wade, who I literally had to Google who was this guy because I had no idea who he was. So many of these open records requests were actually not very serious in nature at all and were not about getting information that was relevant to the community, but about slowing down my office and making sure that we were so busy filling these and spending resources, human resources and financial resources and answering these particular open records requests. And so that was the impetus right, for when we went forward with this. And if you read the actual decision, what you will see is that the Supreme Court actually kept in place uh, some of the immunities. They clarified something that hadn't been clarified in years. Where does the DA office actually sit 
in the Constitution. So we got that clarified. There are other things that they answers that they, uh, I'm sorry, questions that they actually did not answer that we look forward to continuing this litigation to find out those answers because that's the only way that we're actually going to find them out is being able to go through this legal system and have that clarification. Uh, let me get Kalki Allen's response to that uh, judge's ruling, that Supreme Court ruling. Yeah, well, my understanding, I haven't read the opinion in detail, but my understanding is it was a unanimous opinion in which the Supreme Court of Georgia said that Ms. Gonzalez has a fundamental misunderstanding of the separation of powers in the state of Georgia. Transparency is incredibly important. The open records law was passed by the legislature. It is the law of the state of Georgia. And when you receive requests, you're not allowed to make a unilateral decision that you don't respect that law. You don't like how it applies in this situation. So you're just not going to follow it. That's just not an acceptable position for someone who's supposed to be the chief law enforcement officer for the judicial circuit to take. So, um, yeah, you just can't disregard the law because you don't like how someone is using it. Well, let's, let's use that. Hang on to the microphone there, Kathy Ellen. She may well, we'll dive into the second question. In that same vein, the district attorney, Deborah Gonzalez, has said that she will not prosecute abortion cases, not cases on based on Georgia's anti-abortion law. Is that an example of what you're talking about, that, that prosecutors shouldn't get to pick and choose the cases they would prosecute? So, like, I've talked about this several times already. For our family, um, that type of health care that falls within the exceptions of the law is incredibly important because it's things that we've had experience with. Uh, before our first son, Asher was born, Caitlin had a miscarriage and had to have a DNC. Before our second son, James, was born, she had an ectopic pregnancy and had to seek medical care for that as well. And so when there's a treating physician who comes in and says the care I provided falls within the exception under the statute, I'm not a doctor and I'm not going to substitute my judgment as a lawyer for that person's opinion. But, the, but what the, happens... The, respect, the question right. is about the legal part of it. Right, so and that's incredibly... Would you prosecute cases as they came before you as a DA? Well, it, so that is incredibly important not to categorically say that I will never consider any kind of application of this law because what we've seen out of the state of Florida, just south of us, when there was a prosecuting attorney who did that in regards to their opinion on the death penalty, it led to the governor's office removing every single case in which the death penalty could be applied from that office. And so for me, it's incredibly important that that decision remain at the local level with the elected district attorney. Deborah Gonzalez, uh, your response to this? Yeah, so what I've always said is that I respect a woman's autonomy to her body. I respect that women may need to seek reproductive health care and that I would not prosecute them for that nor their providers. The other thing I want to keep in mind, this idea that because I make a decision that then that leads the governor to all of a sudden have this particular power to just take all of the cases away, that's not a comment on me and what I'm doing. That's a comment on him and his feeling and what he wants to do in terms of controlling women and controlling prosecutorial discretion. It was fine prosecutorial discretion when it was done and it was in agreement with the governor and his party as to how it should be used. But all of a sudden, when there are reform-minded district attorneys who decide that they're going to use it in a different way or they're going to make decisions that the governor or people in his party are not in agreement with, well, now it's an abuse of that particular power. But it is still the same power that's always been there. Well, help me understand it as a layman, as a non-attorney, and Deborah Gonzalez, hang on the microphone, and then we'll allow Kyle Yellow and she would also address this. My understanding, as a non-lawyer, as a layman, is that the law says, in this case an abortion law, the law says what the law says. And when it comes to you as a case, you are, as a prosecutor, at least ask, some would say obligated, to try the case, to pursue the case on the merits of the facts and the law. And what am I getting wrong? We are obligated to do our due diligence and review the case. We are not obligated to prosecute every single case 
that comes to our office. There's just not enough resources in order to do that. And so we evaluate each case. We look at the evidence. We look at the facts. We look at all the circumstances of that case. And then we determine, considering our resources, what is going to take priorities? What cases should take priorities? Should a case of a woman seeking reproductive health care take priority over a child molestation case or a murder case or any of these other very serious um, violent crimes that are happening in our community? You know, we can also say due to this particular six-week abortion ban, we already know that there are two women who have died because of it. Because the providers of these aren't sure what the law says, aren't sure if they're going to be held in malpractice, aren't sure if they're going to be arrested. So women are not getting the essential health care that they need, and they are literally dying. And that is two that we know because we also know that there is a two-year lag between these cases that are happening and when they actually come out. And so when we look at we're going to save lives, we want to protect lives, and we want to protect women, we also have to look at this idea of them seeking reproductive health care. Talk to y'all in the and then we'll move on to another topic. So uh, I encourage anyone that wants to see a change in the law to advocate at the legislature for a change in the law. That's the right of every single person to use the democratic process. There have been zero arrests in the state of Georgia underneath this statute, so there have been zero prosecutions to consider. Uh, the effect of the statute has been to make it where providers are not offering any kind of medical care that falls outside of those exceptions. If you want to change the law, the legislature is the place to do that. The district attorney's role is to serve as the agent that prosecutes cases. And as I said before, there have been no arrests in the state of Georgia underneath this law. There haven't been any cases that have been presented for prosecution. If you believe the law is leading to the death of individuals seeking health care, then you should go advocate at the legislature for a change in the law. All right, Kaki Alvin, Chile, hang on to the microphone. The next question, and we'll circle back to the resume you began to outline uh, in your opening statement. I want to focus specifically on your role as an ADA, as a prosecutor. Under, I think most of that, if not all of that, was the idea of the tenure of Ken Malden as district attorney. Talk about what you did and what you learned in that role that you would apply in your role as district attorney should you win the election in two weeks. So uh, I started off working as a low-level felony prosecutor, so the more simpler felonies. I was really successful in that pretty quickly. So before I left the office, I got promoted to a position of leading one of the four superior court courtrooms, which involved prosecuting the most serious crimes, the murders, the crimes against women and children, the sexual assaults, um, and the highway drug trafficking cases, as well as supervising two younger attorneys who were prosecuting the lower level felonies. I mean, what I learned during that time period uh, was how to put a case together and successfully try it to a jury. I also learned how to work within the jurisdiction with partner agencies to make sure that the DA's office was referring cases to felony drug court. We don't just rely on other people to do that. If you believe that's the right place for a case to go, it's incumbent on you as a prosecutor to make it happen. If you want to see something happen, if it's important enough to advocate for it, then you need to have a hand in it. Um, and the referrals have dropped off, I believe, around 80% or so to the accountability courts from the previous administration to the current administration. During 2017 to 2019, there were over 50 referrals uh, that were sent to the uh, felony drug court from DA's office, and I think it's less than 10 in the current administration. So I learned how important it is to be able to work between all those groups in order to get cases to where they needed to go. Um, and so I think I can bring all that to bear in an understanding of how the litigation process works to be able to move cases in the direction we want. And, and we'll circle back to this, but Deborah Gonzalez, uh, the microphone to you, please. As district attorney, your first term in district attorney, uh, Cafiel and Chile outlining his experience as a prosecutor. Describe yours, uh, your experience prosecuting criminal cases in courtrooms. Yeah, so when I came in, it was no secret that I had not prosecuted a case before I came DA. I'm not the only DA in the state of Georgia that that's the truth about. 
In fact, um, there have been appellate judges who have been appointed by our governors who had never done a case either. There is a difference between trial skills, which is what my opponent keeps talking about his experience, and the difference between managing an office. He was never given the authority nor the leadership opportunities while he was there for six years, other than to have a courtroom with two other individuals. He has not had to deal with budgets. He has not had to deal with HR. He has not had to deal with how do you take limited resources and make it work, and how do you face challenges, structural challenges, that are there before you go in and that are there after I leave, that are there that you have to deal with. You know, I have spoken to many DAs. We are part of the DA Association of Georgia. There are 50 of us. And many of them have told me as we talk about this and meet four times a year that the skills that they learned in the courtroom did not translate to the skills that they needed as district attorney. Those are different skills. And as yet, he has not ever laid out the kind of leadership that he would need in terms of administrative, in terms of budget, in terms of enhancing and including some of the relationships that he touts very quickly about in order to make sure that the office runs. Uh, just one more, I want to drill down on this very specifically. Can you give us the number of cases you as a prosecutor in a criminal trial have successfully prosecuted? How many convictions do you as a prosecutor have? Well, I included convictions not just about trials, right? Because 95% of the cases in our circuit are actually resolved by plea negotiation. And that is a national average as well as a state average because, again, there are just not enough resources to bring everything to trial. But since I have been trying cases last year, I have resolved over 1,083 cases in those two years. My opponent, in the six years that he was there, actually only dealt with less than 800 okay, yeah, but in those six was, years. In my trial, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Yeah. I'm I'm getting there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but in terms of the cases and the trials, you know, there was a moment earlier this year where I actually tried six cases in seven weeks. And I was successful in four of those six cases. And considering that kind of time pressure, I consider that pretty successful in terms of not only being in the courtroom and doing those trials, but also being the DA outside of the courtroom and making sure that the office was running, as well as being able to recruit and retain the people who are in that staff, as well as deal with the open records requests that were coming in, which we have always answered. There's not a single open records request that we did not answer even through this litigation. So all of that work has been happening at the same time. Uh, Coffee Alam and Chile, very quickly, can you put a number, an estimate on the number of cases you as a trial lawyer have successfully prosecuted? Uh, many dozens, uh, I believe. I, I don't have a number. I didn't keep a running tally. What I can tell you is I've successfully prosecuted murder cases. I've successfully prosecuted armed robbery cases. I've successfully successfully prosecuted rape cases, I've successfully prosecuted child molestation cases. Ms. Gonzalez has done uh, none of those things uh, in her uh, in her experience in doing trial work. I don't know what the total number of cases I handled when I was at the office was. What I can tell you is from a managerial experience standpoint, you know, it, we talk about leadership. I mean, I was elected to lead the local bar association by my peer attorneys. I was elected to lead the Rotary Club of Athens, the largest civic service organization. Uh, every single person that I've worked with or has worked for me, I believe, is supporting me in this race. Ms. Gonzalez has had over 40 attorneys resign underneath her leadership. Uh, she has, uh, in the budget process, failed to reapply for a grant that's literally going to cost this community hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so, you know, I have not managed the budget of a government office. I've run a successful law practice. Um, but, you know, I don't know that touting a record of failure is the type of experience. You right, well, let's talk about it. You broached the subject there. Hang on the microphone. We'll spend some time on that issue of staffing. You have made that a cornerstone of your campaign here. Talk about what you see as these staffing issues, numbers, if you have them. 
Sure. My understanding right now is that uh, of the 17 attorney positions that are available in the office, only 11 are filled by people who are actually licensed to practice law in the state of Georgia. So, I mean, there's some people who uh, haven't passed the bar exam that they created a position called apprentice assistant district attorney for and have kept them on staff filling an attorney role, even though they don't meet the minimum statutory qualification to work at the district attorney's office. Um, so you have 11 lawyers. Now, the problem is the people that have been hired have uh, an incredibly low level of actual litigation experience. And that's why in the last seven trials that the DA's office has had, they've lost six of them. And in four of those cases, they didn't even get to the point where the jury was deliberating on the case, which is such a low bar to clear. They didn't present enough evidence in order to even get the case to a jury in three of those cases. And in one, they violated the defendant's rights. They didn't turn over his recorded statement with police. And they tried to improperly admit evidence that wasn't admissible, which led to a mistrial in that case. Uh, and so when you're talking about those staffing issues, those are problems. Now, I've been proactive about this. I've started conversations with a dozen people. Ms. Gonzalez wants to describe this as going back and bringing back the old office. I mean, a lot of these are people that she has approached about jobs who didn't want to work for her. And she herself made a job offer to one of her political opponents or had her office reach out and see if that individual was interested in coming back and working for her. So this whole political spin narrative about how, oh, this is about going back, it's not. The problem is we are going backwards and we need to go forward towards a better DA's office and we can only do that with competent, experienced attorneys that are being led in the direction of establishing an office that does the right thing the right way, regardless of whether anyone's watching. DA Deborah Gonzalez, uh, any questions on the staff? Okay, yes, thank you for that. So when I came in, there were four vacancies to begin with, and what's really interesting is somebody actually posted an article from 2004 when Ken Molden came in, absolutely arguing the same thing. Oh, these people are leaving. Oh, there's a revolving door because Ken Molden is now new. This is nothing new when leadership changes, that there is turnover in there. Again, when I was at that District Attorney um, Association of Georgia meeting, there we are, and the question was asked, how many of you have shortages in your office? Every single district attorney raised their hand. This is not a Deborah issue. This is not even the state of Georgia issue. This is a national issue of prosecutor shortages. One of the reasons is because our pay is so low. You know, people start talking about, well, defense attorneys make less than you. No, actually, defense attorneys start at $71,000 a year. A state prosecutor starts at 58000 So we are actually in the legislature trying to get that up so that they are par. Think about it. A state prosecutor is going to do a lot more work than that public defender. Why? Because it's a lot harder to build the house to make the case than it is to throw some stones at it and just be able to create reasonable doubt. This is also an office that never had paralegals, that never had legal assistance, that never had any administrative help at all. Uh, lawyers and victim advocates and investigators were required to do all of those things. So again, if we want a different office and we want a different approach, we're going to try a different structure, and that is what we did. At a time where we had a shortage, we looked at how can we be more creative? What can we do differently to include people? And that meant bringing in people who are not doing things that are required of a licensed attorney. They are not practicing in front of a judge. They are doing the back stuff and research and, and things of that nature, almost like the British system of barristers and solicitors as we do that. Okay, let me yeah, ask, are they analogous to paralegals? Is that the type of work they're doing? Yeah, more or less. But we also have people like, for example, I have one gentleman, he was a prosecutor for over 15 years. He is a retired attorney of 30 years. And so he did not want to take the bar. And he is still in the office being able to be a mentor and to help look at these cases and to get them through. I'm very proud of the fact that I put together a CAPE unit, Case Analysis and Pretrial Evaluation Unit. And in that unit, we do look at cases and see what can go to pretrial diversion, what can go to accountability 
courts. But at the end of the day, a defense attorney has a responsibility to his client to look at all different options for that client and then to advocate for his client to get into these particular programs. My office is not the gatekeeper to those programs. There is a steering committee that has a criteria that will select who can get into those programs or not. We don't keep the lock on those programs. Any defense attorney and any defendant can go to them and say, this is something I want to do. As of now, my office has never denied anybody from getting into that once they have been selected and gone through the eligibility. So to say that it is my office that is doing that is really misleading and is showing that they truly do not understand the way that people get into these accountability courts. That is the district attorney, Deborah Gonzalez, DA, for the judicial circuit, the Western Circuit, that includes Clark and the county counties. We're two weeks away from election day. You are listening, you folks listening on radio, streaming online at WGAUradio.com. You're listening to a candidate's forum from the third floor auditorium of Piedmont Anthens Regional Medical Center. The coverage on WGAU and WGAU streaming at WGAUradio.com provided by, sponsored by CEA Trading, thanks to them. You wanted to add something to her response to the question of staffing coffee on the shield. Staffing and also, let me start with the last thing Ms. Gonzalez said about accountability courts. It's just such a glaring example of why not having actually done the job down in the trenches leads to bad outcomes for people who oftentimes have the least access to resources and advocacy for them. Every person who works closely with accountability courts will tell you that to have a successful program, the prosecuting office, whether it be the DA's office or the solicitor's office, has to be committed to being on the front line and referring cases. And that's because the DA's office gets all of the information first. You get the police report, you get the criminal history before anyone else in the process does, and you have access to uh, conversations with law enforcement about the circumstances of the, co uh, the contact that that person had coming into the system. So when the DA's office, you know, one, isn't turning over discovery for, you know, a year after an arrest has been happened, there's no way for a defense attorney to be able to evaluate a case adequately. And when you're taking the position of, our job is just not to stand in the way, not the position which you should, which justice demands that our job is to get this case and this person connected to the resources that can help them, you are doing a disservice to this community. Deborah Gonzalez, I'll allow you a moment to respond and then we will move on. Thank you. I think sometimes people have a misunderstanding of what I as a progressive prosecutor stand for. We are not a second public defender's office. We will hold people accountable and make those difficult decisions. Defendants are not our clients. Our clients in society is a very different relationship between a defense attorney and a defendant. That defendant is paying that defense attorney or that defense attorney has accepted an appointment to represent zealously that defendant and his interests. That is not what a state prosecutor is about. A state prosecutor is about holding people accountable. And yes, we do have conversations with defense attorneys about their clients to learn about them, but at the end of the day, the defense attorneys know much more about their clients than we will ever know. And we may know the facts and the evidence that we get from law enforcement, but if we're talking about these alternative ways of helping individuals, we have to look at it holistically. And if the defense attorney isn't willing to work with us and to step up and say, yes, I want my people to do this, then there is no way that this is going to work either. It's a holistic approach. It's a collaborative approach. But there have been many times that I've reached out across to the public defender chief, John Donnelly, and said, let's work together on this, including the restorative justice program for juveniles. And his response to me was, I don't have time. I need to deal with this case. Or his response is, that's prosecution. It has nothing to do with me. All right. And in terms of juveniles and minors, that brings me to a point and a question. And the point I should have made earlier is that a great many of these questions were submitted uh, via email and online from the radio audience and elsewhere. And this is one of those. And I'm going to read it uh, as written by the questioner. Uh, and this deals with the issue specifically, as you'll hear, of truancy. 
Ms. Gonzalez ran on a platform of not prosecuting minors for truancy. Does she understand that the juvenile court system is designed not to punish these kids, but to provide services to the entire family, such as transportation, therapy, parenting, etc., to resolve the issue before the child is adjudicated a delinquent? Instead of ignoring these issues, shouldn't we try intervention before the child's behavior escalates and he or she becomes a danger to the community? Uh, the long question from a listener there. I hope you got the most out of Deborah Gonzalez here. Your chance to respond. Yes, so thank you. Yes, so I have been very open that I was not going to prosecute truancy, but guess what? Neither did my predecessor. Neither did the Solicitor General before the Solicitor General now. Nobody's ever prosecuted truancy. The other thing that I said is that I will not make empty threats to families, right? What we have to stop doing is we have to stop putting social ills into the criminal justice system. If somebody has a mental illness issue, then we need to deal with that. We have a very sad circumstance right now in terms of competency. People can get stuck in competency court because their defense attorney puts in an evaluation and then they come back from DBHDD saying, oh yeah, they're incompetent, but they can be restored and they end up spending years in this system. We need to fix that when it comes to substance abuse and we have lots of treatment programs out there um, for that. We need to get to the underlying issue. But this issue of truancy and trying to separate families, and yes, is it about truly the best interest of the child when you're taking them out of their homes and you're putting them into a foster care system that really leaves a lot to be desired, we have to look way ahead to the consequences of what trauma happens to these children when they are taken away from their families and put into systems that are really not about their best interests, that are really not about taking care of them as they grow up and age out of this system. And so what I have done, I've said, no, we need to take a step back and see what that decision is actually going to end up on that child three, five, ten years from now when they are released and their parents aren't there. And so no, but again, I don't prosecute it. My predecessor didn't prosecute it. The Solicitor General didn't prosecute it. This is a red herring thrown to distract you from the actual reform work that we have done. question, would you prosecute truancy? So, uh, it's important to understand what we're talking about. These aren't delinquency cases. They're what are called child in need of service cases or CHINS cases. And the DA's office's role is not to act as a prosecutor the way you would if a child's alleged to have broken a criminal statute. You're actually acting in the function of what is called a guardian ad litem, which is to give the court an opinion on what is in the best interest of the child. And this isn't about separating families. It's about understanding that kids that aren't getting to school are often coming from families that are facing some kind of hardship that having counseling and wraparound services and very other things that are available through juvenile court, which really is a treatment court modality, not a punitive court modality, uh, can help that family get into a situation where that child is going to school again. The other thing is when kids are missing school, it is oftentimes one of the first indicators of either physical or sexual abuse that is happening in the household. So to ignore it as the DA's office also doesn't even stop it from happening. We should talk about that also. What's happening right now is the DA's office is vacating a role that it has and should be filling as the elected representative for the state in juvenile court, and juvenile court is proceeding in these chintz cases with a contract attorney being hired to come in and handle the chintz cases that involve truancy. So it's not even that I'm not going to deal with it, and so it's not going to move forward. What's happening is your elected district attorney is saying, I'm not going to offer an opinion on what should be going on with these kids. And I think it's incredibly important. We're not talking about putting kids in jail. We're talking about connecting families with resources who are having a hard time and possibly bringing in social workers to identify a situation where a child is in an abusive setting. And I believe we have an obligation to do that. Let's talk about... Can I just... Um, can I, can I a, a, very quickly. Very quickly. Why do you have to get system involved in order to get services? I don't understand that. Why, why do we have to do that? Why do we have to give a kid a record? 
Why can't we just have more counselors in the schools? Why can't we just have those social workers in the schools to help when the kids happen? Why do we have to get them system involved? That's where the trauma and the harm happens. And so, no, I don't believe that it's vacating. I believe that it's saying no to something that shouldn't be in our workplace at all, shouldn't be part of my responsibilities. Again, We have to stop putting these social ills into this criminal justice system and start putting the resources that are needed to help these kids where they can get it. It does not need to be. Let me me ask you something really quickly about that. I'm going to give Kaki another chance to respond to your Kaki Alamachili. But I mean, okay, you can say as you did. And I don't mean, I'm not trying to fact check you here. I want to continue this Mm -hmm. conversation. You know, well, that's an issue that should be resolved in the school system level, perhaps. But you're not the school board, you're not the DA in these cases, or you're not on the Board of Education Mm -hmm. or the school superintendent. These cases come to you as the DA. Uh, Golf lingo, you play the ball as it lies, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I play (laughs) putt-putt. I don't don't play golf, I play putt-putt. But but yeah, you, you put it as it lies. But again, my predecessor didn't do this. The Solicitor General didn't do this. This is a complete red herring that only we're going to attack Deborah because she has said it. And that is the thing that happens over and over and over again, these incensus attacks and this intimidation because I actually say what it is that I'm going to do. Unlike my opponent, who you don't know what he's going to do because so many times he's hiding behind a label that's not even his. All right, uh, and Kaki, I want you to give a final word on this and then we do need to move on. How does a kid that is not going to school get access to a social worker at the school or a counselor at the school? I mean, that's what my opponent just said is the solution to kids not going to schools. You know, it, we, we can do these political games about labeling people as things or saying that I'm the victim of not stepping forward to do certain things, but my focus isn't on name calling. It is on Delivering a district attorney's office that does right by our kids, can hold serious violent offenders accountable, and can connect people that need help with resources, and doesn't find ways to blame other people in the system, denigrating defense attorneys and public defenders to defend a failed record. Right. That's the kind of DA's office we have. This this question coming from, again, the audience, and it's it's the big question. We could probably spend the rest of our 45 minutes or so on this. We'll try to limit the discussion somewhat, but I do want to say, and you may have noticed we've tossed any time constraints out the window. I'm not going to do the one minute thing went away several minutes ago. Uh, But this is a big topic, and a lot of people are concerned about this. Uh, A judge has found you, Deborah Gonzalez, in violation of the Victim Rights Bill, Marcy's Law, as it is called, It's four or five times, I'm not sure which, uh, I'm genuinely not sure which, uh, four or five times in two years. Speak to that. Yeah, first of all, they didn't find me, they found my office. Let's be, you know, words matter (laughs) when we do this. Um, But one thing that I will say on this is we have no idea what happened before I walked into my office. We have no idea what was going on with my predecessor in terms of victims' rights and victim services. In fact, last week I sat with the sister of a victim of a crime from 25 years ago where she was crying because she had not been given any kind of help at all. And this person who had killed her sister was now coming up for parole, and she didn't know what to deal with it. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know what to say. And so we had a long conversation with her, her father, her brother, talking about what was going to happen and also finding her resources that were not available 25 years ago. We spend every day talking and working with victims, victims who are young, victims who are older, victims of crimes that have happened in the last few months, victims of crimes that have happened in previous years as we go through You know, one thing that you said, Tim, about finding people as they are, right? Circumstances as they are. There are some victims who do not want to be notified. They don't want to know about their cases because it's so traumatic 
for them. And so we respect that if that's what they want to do. And there are others, you know, victims are to be treated with respect. We're the first one in the whole state to have a victim trauma-informed victim lounge. We've worked with um, the school social work to be able to do that for our victims. We have the first um, social work internship with the School of Social Work of UGA, as well as with Athens Tech. This was not there before, and we were able to bring in that expertise that was not there before. We have started getting our victim advocates certified nationally through the National Association of Victim Advocates. We have two so far. Our goal is to have all of them done by next year. These are things that we put in. Have things happened? Yes. And each of those is an experience to learn, to be better, and um, you know, not to make it happen again. Things happen. We're human. Just the same way is I advocate that all people deserve a second chance. I also advocate that people in my office who may have made a mistake just don't get thrown out by that first mistake that they made, that they learn how they can make amends, how to make it better, that they go to training, and that they come back and that they do better and that they can teach others as well. Kaki, Alam, and Sheila, your thoughts on Marcy's Law, Marcy's Law violations? I, I want to talk about this in specific ways because, you know, these aren't numbers. These are human beings who are victims of crimes and deny justice in their case. Um, you know, one of these violations is a woman whose husband was killed by a drunk driver who the district attorney's office reduced that charge from vehicular homicide to a misdemeanor, and they did not contact her in order to inform her that that plea was going to be entered until the morning it was going to be entered. She was teaching class at Athens Tech, I believe, so she didn't get notification, and they pushed forward with that plea anyway. And I believe it was Ms. Gonzalez herself who entered that plea in court. It was fun. When they entered the Marcy's Law, um, when Marcy's Law violation was filed, the district attorney's defense in that case was that because they were common law married that she wasn't really his wife and she wasn't entitled to notice on the statute. That is so missing the force for the trees in what you owe to victims um, it is to be just completely shocking. Another one that occurred was a child who was being raped by her father who was willing to step forward and testify at trial. Jury selection, I believe, was about to begin, at which point the district attorney's office dismissed the case, saying that there wasn't enough evidence for guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and they did it without really consulting with the victim or the victim's family, which led to another Marcy's Law violation, and thankfully conflict at this DA's office out, because one of our neighboring district attorneys came in and tried that case himself, and he got a guilty verdict on all charges in about an hour for a Clark County jury, and that person was sentenced to life in prison. So it's very important to talk about the specifics of what are happening in these things, because it's easy to talk about it as just one case, or two cases, or three, or four, or five, or how many, however many we're talking about. But for the people involved, it is the most important case that's ever existed in their entire lives. And we've got a duty to make sure, especially in these most serious cases, this should never happen when we're talking about a child being sexually assaulted. This should never happen when we're talking about somebody being killed. This isn't somebody just missing a notification of a bond hearing on some kind of death case. These cases deserve the highest level of service that we can bring to bear, and there are no excuses for that. <laughs> Be ordered by a judge, I believe Judge Stevens, you and your office, to take what amounts to a refresher course on Marcy's Law, the criminal victims' rights. Uh, for my own edification, what is the status uh, of that matter right now? Is the training underway? Is it pending? What's happening with that? Yes, so actually, we take that training twice a year, and we took it on October 4th. And in fact, when we spoke with the Prosecuting Attorneys Council to get that training up and going, they ended up having over 150 different individuals from all different circuits um, signing up for that course and showing just how much confusion there is about how do you adhere to Marcy's Law and how do you adhere to these victims' 
crime of um, Bill of Rights. So it was really interesting, some of the questions that actually came out in that training from other circuits, what questions they had in terms of these particular laws and how it is that they can convey it. And so that was very eye-opening for PAC itself to think that, you know, they thought that everybody knew what it meant. They thought that the trainings that they had done had sort of cleared that up. But to have 150 attorneys and investigators and victim advocates sign up to say, we really don't understand this. We really need you to help explain it, I thought, also did a good service for everybody in this profession. A, a question born of utter ignorance on my part, and maybe you don't know, and that's fine, but okay. it occurs to me to wonder, surrounding service, you mentioned prosecutors coming in, surrounding service, I gather voluntarily, uh, what is the track record, if anybody knows it, of surrounding judicial circuits? Anybody else having problems with Marcy's laws in terms of violations? These are issues that have happened throughout the years. The difference is is that we have an individual who single-mindedly is committed to bringing these into hearings. Most of the time, what has happened is that if there is an issue, the victims are brought in in front of the judge. The judge hears what they have to say. The judge makes his ruling. The case goes forward, and that is all that we have. So there isn't a list of every time that this has happened because it's not something that has been taken all the way to into the effect into these hearings, right? And this is also relatively new when Marcy's Law came in in 2018, um, I believe is when that started, that uh, they started doing those. And so the legislature itself, and this is something that even the judges have commented, that there's a lot of ambiguity around this, around what is the hearing, what's allowed. Each of the three judges have uh, uh, sort of addressed it in different ways, and they have also made the statement that maybe legislature has to take this back and sort of look at it and give some better guidance than what we have there and maybe um, outline what the hearing should look like because each of the three judges have approached it very differently, right? But my point is... You know, we take these training regularly. Different people come into the office and leave, and they take it again. But to find that there was so much interest in this also shows that there's a lot of confusion out there, not just in my circuit, but throughout the state of what these laws mean and how to be able to comply with them. And talk to you all about it. And to that point, if you know, you know, fine. If you don't, fine. Also, but what, what is your understanding of what may be going on in other jurisdictions, other circuits with Marcy's Law and violations? My understanding is that in the state of Georgia, our current district attorney's office has the only five violations that have ever been ordered as having been found by a judge. That's my understanding. So the simple answer to that question is no, it's not an issue. And, you know, I know Ms. Gonzalez points up to other circuits where she feels like this is some kind of mass targeting of progressive prosecutors. But I don't think there's been a finding of one down in Savannah. I don't think there's been a finding of one over in Atlanta. It is a problem that is unique to this district attorney's office. And it's just reflective. I mean, I don't think people are doing it intentionally, obviously. But when you have a place that is just an utter, utter and complete dysfunction, where the office is kind of listing between one crisis and another, this is what happens. Victims get hurt and criminal defendants get hurt too, frankly. I mean, you know, we were talking about victims' rights and we always should be talking about that. But what doesn't get covered is the fact that this DA's office had someone incarcerated for 13 months on a low-level felony, a $2,000 bond, without even accusing or indicting the case. And when it came up on a hearing for the violation of that person's right to a constitutional speedy trial, the response from the DA's office was, well, Judge, we didn't realize this case existed until you set it for a hearing today. And so this dysfunction hurts people across the board. Uh, and, and that's the reason we have to make a change. That's the reason we have to move forward. And we can do better, and I will do better. That's why I'm asking for your vote either during early voting or on November 5th. We cannot keep letting this happen. Right. We have to do this. And we have to move forward also. But I want to, because you raised the case, I want Deborah Gonzalez, District Attorney Gonzalez, to respond to the last point that you made about that specific case, if you recall it, if you're familiar with it. 
<clears throat> Can you just repeat one? It's the guy, Jabaz Andre Jones, who was in jail for 13 months without being indicted. 13 months, more than a year without yeah, being So indicted. one of the things that happens and that people don't understand is that judges set their own calendars. This is different in our circuit. So uh, Covey, for example, it's the DA that sets the calendars, and so they're able to um, decide which case goes when. But here in our circuit, it is the judges who decide things that happen. Now, we have one judge who is very regular. We have arraignment two months later. We have status two months after that. We have trial. But we have another judge, and that was the judge of this courtroom, that can put a case up and not come back to that case for two years, right? And so when you are working on the calendars, when you are trying to make sure that somebody is prepared and in front of that judge for what is going to happen that particular day or that particular month, it is also the priorities that the judge sets in order to know which cases are going to go forward. So, you know, there are some things that we can control, but scheduling is not one of them. Deborah Gonzalez, District Attorney. Again, for the radio audience, you're listening to WGAU Athens, the Candidates Forum, Deborah Gonzalez, the first term incumbent DA, and the challenger in the election that is now two weeks away, Coffee Help and Chile. We're in Piedmont Athens Regional Medical Center, the third floor auditorium there. Thanks again to our host this evening. And thanks also for sponsoring this radio broadcast and the online stream, CEH Rating. I want to speak to, and this goes to the question, DA Gonzalez, that so many raise, and I'm sure you're aware that it's being raised, that question of prosecutorial competence. Coffee Hall, which you mentioned a moment ago, a case with which I'm familiar, I actually personally know the prosecutor in this case, uh, was a case of a man, a father, accused of sexually assaulting his young daughter. It was a case that was, and correct anything I get wrong, but it was a case that was dismissed by your office. Randy McGinley, prosecutor in the Alcove Circuit, Newton and Walton Counties, successfully prosecuted that case to the point where the jury returned guilty on all count verdicts in 45 minutes. For lack of a better question, what happened and what does that say about the level of prosecutorial competence in your office? Well, first of all, you know, things change. People come in and out of an office. The individual who was responsible, the state prosecutor, the ADA at that moment, he is no longer in the office. And this is one of the reasons why he is not in the office. Decisions are made by individual assistant district attorneys. They are given certain autonomy because they are the ones who are going to be looking at that case, looking at the evidence. I, as a DA, cannot look at every single case that comes into the office. There are a thousand of them. That is just an impossible task in terms of that. But sometimes an ADA will make a decision that I have multiple cases with this particular individual. This case is not one that is good or going to go forward. It cannot meet the burden of beyond a reasonable doubt, but this other case can. Um, I don't know all of the reasons why this particular ADA decided that he was not going to pursue this case. He wanted to pursue the other case with the same defendant and the same victim and made that decision at that time. It turned out to be not the right decision. I respect Randy McKinley very well. He's been, you know, very helpful to me in helping guidance and, and helping with some of the things that we have had. But there are different levels of prosecutorial um, expertise, and we need to start building pipelines and pools in order to get the people up and going. On average, an ADA will stay in that office anywhere between four to five years before they move on. Many of them do not decide to become what we call careerists in terms of being a state prosecutor. Why? Because it's, it's very intensive work, and you don't get paid a lot of money. And so many of them will go in for a few years when they're relatively young, learn about how to do a trial, and then move on to either have their own law firm or work with another private firm where they can make a lot more money than what they're making as a state prosecutor. And then you have those that you've invested in that stay there for a number of years. And so a few of the people that I had hired before had reached sort of that four or five year 
point where they were deciding what they wanted to do with the rest of their career, and many of them wanted to make more money. When the um, athens Clark County government did their market study, what they discovered was that we were anywhere from 10 to 26% less competitive in terms of salary than our areas around where people can go 20 minutes and get $20,000 more. But we are building on that pipeline, and that is something and a strategy that DAs have used across the state is to build that pipeline and to be able to train them and get them through. I just very quickly, then I want to hear from Yael and Chile on this. The decision to dismiss in that particular case, you're saying, was not yours but was the ADA's. That's right. My ADAs have a certain amount of autonomy in the decisions they make, and I trust them because they are the ones who are in the trenches with that particular case. Again, I cannot review every single detail on every single case. Fair enough. Copy Alma and Chile. Speak to that, the level of autonomy that uh, ADAs may have in your office as VA, if you may. It, it's based on case severity. Um, in, in the situation where you're talking about uh, incest rape of a child, I want to know what's happening with the case before a decision is made, especially if you're going to dismiss a case after you've started jury selection. That is an extreme action to take. We're not talking about you know two months before when it pops up on a status calendar. So anything that has to do with a murder case or a, a rape or a child molestation that's going to trial, I'm going to be read in by the ADA. Am I going to sit there and listen to every single interview? No, but you sit down and part of mentorship and guidance and training people to do the job well is sitting down with them and talking to them about what's going on in their courtroom, especially with their most serious cases. So that's something that ultimately the DA is responsible for. There's no way to kind of shuffle off that responsibility to lower level staff. I mean, that's the reason that you elect a district attorney because you have someone that's accountable for the things that happen in that office. From a broader staffing perspective, um, you know, the Piedmont Judicial Circuit, which is right next door, that's where my wife, Caitlin, works as an assistant district attorney, uh, is fully staffed, has been fully staffed. Uh, the county where Randy works, um, you know, if they're not at 100% staffing, they certainly never went through the issues that we uh, had here in this district attorney's office. And it's not really something, you know, going back and change of administration, yes, that's going to lead to turnover. Um, you know, one of the things that was a difference when Ken came in is Ken basically tried all the murder cases, and so he's handling the most serious stuff and was able to carry that weight. But, of course, there's going to be turnover. But let's look at the record of what actually happened. In 2021 and into about the first half of 2022, Ms. Gonzalez was able to hire new attorneys. They were leaving very quickly, and if you look at comments that they've made about why, it's because of a failure in leadership and mentorship, but people were coming in. It's not like we couldn't fill the positions. It's just that they were leaving within a couple of months of starting, and to me, that's an indication of a lack of leadership in the office, and it's a pretty clear indication, and also it's the reason why UJ's Law School has cut off one of those great feeder pipelines of really, really smart kids who want to be prosecutors. I was up there, me and Ryan Swingle, who's here tonight, were up there talking to the criminal law student group, and there are kids interested in being prosecutors who are interested in working in Athens, just not under this administration, and they say that pretty explicitly. All right, Coffee Alma Gina, we just passed the top of the seven o'clock hour. I have been lax and lenient on time to this point, however, uh, we will end this at 7.30 and not at 7.31. So we can begin to tighten up the responses to some of these questions here. And again, questions from our audience. Deborah Gonzalez, we'll start with you on this one. How can the DA have a positive impact on the opioid and drug problem and the larger gang problem? Speak to that, District Attorney yes. Gonzalez. Thank you. So um, our office has partnered with the ACCPD to create the SAFE initiative, strategically addressing the fentanyl epidemic. This is something where we have representatives from hospitals and representatives from the different recovery programs and representatives from different community programs to go up there and to do trainings of Narcan, for example, to educate the community on how it is that they can help people that they feel might actually be under the influence or, or have an issue with substance abuse or addiction where they can get help. It is based on the issue that you first 
approach people where they are. And once you can go to where they are and get them the help that they need at that moment, then you can continue the conversations of what treatment they need and where they can go from there. So we have been very, very active as a partner in that, including helping to get um, grants for that, helping to do resource fairs. We just had a resource fair at the Pinewoods Library on that particular issue, and also doing it bilingually, doing it in English and Spanish, reading, reaching a community that this district attorney has not reached out before. We are the first office here to have materials both in English and Spanish. Our website can be translated into 23 different languages, understanding that we have others. As for the gang issue, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Very quickly. Okay. As, well, that's for, a small problem, right? <laughs> um, as for the gang issues, you know, I've, I've been very active. I've taken groups, including our juvenile judges and community members, in, to look on site at different programs like the Front Porch in Savannah, like Wimberley Woods in, um, oh, in Barrow. Uh, these kind of programs and models to show what it is that we can do in youth prevention. But the truth of the fact is we also have a mayor commission that just reallocated $3.7 million that had been set aside for youth prevention and moved it into infrastructure saying, oh, well, we ran out of time to create programs. There are lots of programs out there that do work, whether they're in San Diego or anywhere else in this country that have been proven to work that we can bring here. I have also been advocating since 2022 to have a prosecutor, a gang prosecution unit to complement the ACCPD gang unit so that we can have somebody who is just focused on those kinds of cases, but who also understand that not every case with gang members is actually a gang case the way that it's defined by Georgia law, that it has to be something that is done in furtherance of that gang and someone who can distinguish that. And we had an excellent candidate who had been doing this and serving in that role in um, DeKalb County and wanted to come here, was working on a case with our law enforcement and that gang unit here. And we just could not get through this salary compression issue from the mayor commission to bring that person here and to have that needed resources. And this is why I say that there are structural changes, financial and structural changes that we have no control over, that the mayor commission does, that does not allow us to bring some of those needed resources to our community. And, and let me bring Kafiala and Chile in on this. Assuming that you were to win the election, you would face presumably those same financial constraints. How would you deal with it? We have never paid as much as DeKalb County has ever. And, and you know, we're not financially in a situation where we're ever going to pay as much as metro counties have. Uh, but that hasn't ever led to a situation where we've faced a type of severe staffing shortages and the inability to retain the experienced prosecutors that we currently are. And so we can look to blame others, but I think that when you look at the actual facts of what's been going on and how many people have cycled through that office, it's very clear that it's a leadership issue. Um, to the two things you brought up before, though, because uh, I think it's incredibly important. Yes, uh, Narcan distribution amongst not just police officers, but all first responders and also people who are just out in the community, especially in our homeless community, has led to a decline in the number of overdose deaths. I think that's really important. Community education is always important to substance abuse prevention. Uh, we should continue to do those things, absolutely. On the game question, Thankfully, the Attorney General's office has stepped in in the absence of an effective prosecutorial office in our district attorney's office to handle some of the most serious gang issues. You don't create some kind of magic solution by giving someone the title of gang prosecutor. We've already got open positions. There's only 11 licensed attorneys in the office out of 17 positions. So, I mean, there are positions available to hire people into. 
Saying that now I have a gang prosecutor is a political messaging problem. What you need is prosecutors who are trained in prosecuting gang cases, not a special label. I've been to PAC's gang prosecution training, and I know a lot of other people who have been. It is important to understand that you have to create a nexus between the crime that was committed and saying that it's committed in furtherance of criminal street gang activity. But it doesn't require a special title to do it. It requires a competent and experienced prosecutor, and that's who I am, and that's who I can internally train the people in the office to be. Thank you, Alma Gina. Hold on to the microphone. Now, the next question is for you. And, and it deals with, it's a political question, a partisan question. He made it a point from day one to run as an independent, not under a party label. However, it is pointed out that you are surrounded by, in terms of advisors, people who are staffing your campaign, people you're associated with, you're, uh, you're working with Republicans, and there is a guilt by association discussion about whether you are, in fact, yourself a Republican. Does that matter? Should it matter? No, it shouldn't matter. I ran an independent campaign because I believe we need a DA's office that brings together as broad a coalition as possible, not one that tries to divide people based on partisan beliefs that aren't core to the issues that the DA's office faces. I really do believe that out in the community, there's probably 70% of people who believe in the core tenets of what I'm talking about, about a DA's office, that is about public service and that it's about delivering for victims, connecting people with resources and helping our kids make better decisions. I've got Republicans and Democrats supporting my campaign. You will see my yard sign in yards with candidates from both parties. Uh, I have had support everywhere from Sheriff Hale in Oconee County to Mayor Gertz in Clark County. And that is that broad base of support because those people have known me, they've seen me work in the community, they've seen me volunteer, they've seen me in a courtroom, and they understand the type of character and the type of ethos I will bring to this office, which is one that will do the right thing the right way regardless of whether anyone is watching. And victims don't walk in with a sign around their neck that says Democrat or Republican. And we deserve a DA's office that will serve their, these victims not their own partisan political beliefs. This point, this claim of a broad base of support, I, I, I'm looking in this room and I see people I know personally who supported your campaign four years ago outside of this room with Mayor Kelly Gertz, who supported your campaign four years ago, are not now, are in fact supporting your opponent. What are we to make of that? What do you make of that? Well, first of all, I'd like to answer the same question that my opponent answered. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to say is this is a partisan election. It is in the Constitution that it, people run under a party label. And you have the choice of whether to run as Democrat, as Republican, or as Independent, as my opponent did. I think it's important when you put those labels that people understand the kind of values that you have. If you can't be honest about where your money is coming from, if you can't be honest about your affiliations to some of these people who are at the core going against some of the basic rights, say these are the people who have taken the rights of women away. These are the people who want to take trans rights away. These are the people who are against LGBTQ. These are the individuals who are associated with this. And when you affiliate with that, when you affiliate with that, and yet you don't want to be honest about it, right? To me, that is a question of honesty and integrity. Be who you are. The one thing that you will say about me is I have said I'm a Democrat from the very beginning. That has never changed. I have never wavered. And it's interesting to me that my opponent, after months of us asking for a plan, after extensive attacks and intimidation, all of a sudden puts out today two weeks before the election, a plan that looks remarkably like the things that I have already been putting in the office, right? Who is he fooling? Why is it that when he goes into one room where there are Republicans, his story is one thing. When he goes into another room with Democrats, his story is another. If it truly was going to be a coalition of everybody across the board, the story should be consistent and the same. <laughs> 
see our last question. Uh, I'll, I'll watch the clock here as we work our way toward the bottom of the hour. And then we're going to have some closing statements uh, from you folks to get out of here by 730. Uh, question for you and Deborah Gonzalez, DA Gonzalez, your chance to respond afterwards. What is County Almanchili going to do to prosecute crimes against locally owned businesses in Athens, shoplifting, theft, burglary, uh, crimes and business owners who have suffered by not getting their cases tried or restitution paid during the Gonzalez tenure? There's an obvious, and that's a question from the audience, there, there's an obvious uh, point made about prosecutions or like they're uh, in your office, DA Gonzalez, I'll let you respond to that. But first, County Almanchili, your take on this. Yeah, I mean, if somebody violates a criminal statute of the state of Georgia, we're going to prosecute that case. Um, you know, restitution to the victim is always a factor we should consider, and it's something that when someone suffered a loss, it needs to be in considerations for the sentence. Uh, when you're talking about people who are committing, and I put residential burglaries in a different category than businesses, I'm going to talk just about businesses and shopliftings, um, you know, when, when you're dealing with those people, a lot of times what you're seeing is someone who has some kind of underlying substance abuse or mental health issue. And I understand a lot of times people get frustrated to the point where they're saying, you know, how many chances does this person get? What we've got to really think about though as a community is that absent the very most serious charges of you know, murder, armed robbery, uh, sexual offenses against people. These people are coming back into the community at some point, even if there's a confinement component of their sentence. So yes, we're going to prosecute those cases. But when we're fashioning a sentence, we want to make an attempt to address that underlying issue. I mean, it's just coming at it from a common sense perspective. If we're not trying to do something to connect that person with a resource during the course of their sentence, uh, we just know that the behavior is going to repeat. And again, that's why it's so important for the DA and the DA's employees and prosecutors who are trained by the district attorney to understand that you need to be pushing these cases into these courts. It's not the defense attorney's job. The prosecutor is supposed to seek justice, which means that you do the right thing based upon the situation that you're encountering. You don't defer and blame it on defense attorneys that aren't doing things. If you see someone that needs to be connected with resources, you drive that case towards that resolution. That's your job. And it's not something that you can abdicate to someone else because pursuing justice is your job. Deborah Gonzalez, Mr. Attorney Deborah Gonzalez, the implication, the allegation in that question, is, as you heard, is that your office has been less than aggressive in prosecuting these types of cases. What is your response? How should these cases be handled? And what has, has your office been doing? Okay, thank you for the question. Yes, yeah, so we look at every single case that comes into our office. We do our due diligence with every single case. One of the things, though, is that what do you do with someone who has 14 shoplifts? Obviously, putting them back in incarceration isn't going to stop that behavior. And so most of the time, the sentences that we have include substance abuse evaluations, include recommended treatment, include life skills workbooks, include things like mental health evaluations and recommended treatments. They include these things because we understand that putting them just in incarceration is not going to help. The other thing I want to make very clear, in Athens, we have a state court. So many of those shopliftings are actually misdemeanors that are handled by the Solicitor General. In Oconee, we do not. In Oconee, there isn't a state court. So we actually handle those misdemeanors as well. But again, we're looking at a sentence as a package, not just incarceration. And that's the only way that we address it. The other thing that's very interesting is if you look at the stats recent that the athens Clark County Police Department put out, they actually say that crime is down. Crime is down for the second time, second year in a row. Crime, violent crime is down 10%. Shootings are down 27%. You want to know what's up? DUIs, public drunkenness. Why? We are a college town. And we have kids that for the first time are away from their parents who have never been on their own before. And we have many of them making many bad decisions about going out there and getting drunk and drinking excessively. You know, one of the things we don't talk about is also what happens during the red zone in UGA, which is the first three months that a young 
a female student is here on campus, that is the most vulnerable time for her. When I came and spoke with UGA and asked, what are they doing about it? They said, well, we talk with the young girls. I said, well, do you talk with the young men about what consent is? And they said, no. But that's important to do, right? It's not just the girls' responsibility to make sure that they're not wearing a certain thing or that they're keeping themselves safe. It's also a young man's responsibility in terms of how he's going to treat those women that he encounters here. So there are many issues when we look at this idea of all the bars that we have in our town and how we are actually sort of serving up these types of alcohol, underage sometimes even, we also have to look at that in terms of what's happening in our communities and the rise in crimes in those particular instances. All right, Deborah Gonzalez, this will be the final question before we get to closing statements. And I'm going to keep kind of a watch on the time on this. We don't want to leave time for the closing statements. But it's a big question. It's on the community's minds. You drive around and you see the signs and tell you the community is thinking about this. Why the decision? What was the basis of the decision? We're going to let Kaki Alamachi respond as well. What was the basis of the decision to bring in an outside prosecutor for the Lake and Riley murder case? Take 90 seconds on that. So I was trying not to, keep, not to make it political. That's really the reason why we did it. One of the things is once we found out that the defendant was Latino, I'm Latina. I did not want that to become an issue. I did not want that to become a distraction. I wanted the best prosecutor that we can have, and I didn't want the community sort of distracted by something else of a personal aspect of mine. And so we actually spoke with the prosecuting attorney's counsel. Uh, we had many conversations. I know Sheila Ross. She is an excellent prosecutor. In fact, she is the number one capital murder prosecutor that we have in Georgia. And I asked specifically for her so that she can come and do that case. And they agreed. And so they come. She works under me. She's under my authority. She's my special ADA and special prosecutor. So we have not just given it up. We still have those conversations in my office about what she's going to do with the case, how what the strategy is, how we go forward. Uh, and I'll have one more thought on that. And again, I'll, I'll watch the time here. Uh, the decision, I know you campaigned on this, not to seek death penalty cases or death penalty trials, period. Uh, the argument goes, and the logic goes, and I'm sure it follows to a point, that if that were a card that were still to be played, you might not have a trial at all. He may have pleaded guilty. Did you at any point consider that in, in deciding not to seek capital charges in this case? We considered everything in this case. We sat with the family, and we had many discussions about this particular choice of whether to pursue the death penalty or not. I'm not going to go into those conversations. This is a pending case. I'm not going to do anything that is going to disqualify my office from that. But what I did say, it was a long, hard conversation that we had in looking over those issues um, in there. And, you know, we will look at each case individually. But there are also aspects of how much does it cost, how it changes the attention from the victim. And as I said once before with truancy, I'm not going to issue false threats. If we're going to say we're going to take this as a death penalty, then we have to be ready that it's going to go all the way to the death penalty and not just look at it as a strategy so that somebody will plead down to just murder and take life. You have to be ready to go all that way. And I think it's very easy to sit back and say, well, this is what I would do. Yes, that is what you may do, but you're not in the seat. You're not talking with that family. You're not looking at everything that we are looking at and when we make those decisions. All right, Coffee Alvin, she will give you two minutes to address the Lake and Riley case. And the question that I posed initially deals with bringing in outside counsel. Is that something you would anticipate doing in certain cases, or would you rule it out? The district attorney who's elected for this circuit should be the one that either handles the case directly or has their staff handle it so they can be accountable for the outcomes. I will say that I am glad for the Riley family that Sheila Ross has come in to prosecute that case because we don't have a DA's office that can handle serious violent felonies. I'm not going to make additional comments about that case because I hope to be leading the office that's handling it if it doesn't go to trial in a few weeks here in the middle of November. 
But what I've gone out and talked to to people is that when we talk about justice for all, why is it that one case that's more high profile gets a competent prosecutor brought in from the outside when there are a lot of other victims, including families who've lost a loved one to a murder, who are not getting a competent prosecutor brought in to handle their case? That is not justice for all. It is not. And I'm committed to delivering justice for all. I've said the same thing about what kind of office I want to leave from when I made my announcement in the first week of October on the steps of the Athens Clark County Courthouse. I've talked to about accountability courts in front of conservative audiences, and I've talked about holding violent offenders accountable in front of progressive audiences because it's not a conservative or progressive issue. It is an issue of public safety, public service, and it's an issue of right and wrong. And what is going on right now is just wrong. And I just want to touch briefly because there's some mention of privacy in this case. Uh, in 2019, there were 354 aggravated assaults. In 2021, there were 529. So that was a 49.43% increase. Now, those numbers from ACCPD seem to have come down, but the aggravated assaults in 2023 were still 19.2% higher. And I think it's interesting because in the actual data that the DA's office is releasing about what's happening in their office, they have decided that they've actually gotten more crimes for prosecution every year since 2020. Right. I'm going to have to ask you to include any more of that in your closing statement because that is where we are. I'm going to be strict on the timing on this. Deborah Gonzalez, and, and again, we, we, we did a drawing initially to determine who goes first, who goes last. B.A. Gonzalez, your two-minute closing statement. Thank you so much. And again, thank you to Piedmont for hosting us. Thank you to Athens Classic for putting this together. Thank you to Brian for moderating. Never easy, but I appreciate your humor. I really do. Um, and thank you all for being here, because without you participating, we don't have a democratic system. It is really important that we get informed about candidates, that we ask the questions that we need to ask, that we hear directly from them and not just through third parties. When I look at this election, and, and first of all, I'm really proud that we're having this. I mean, for 48 years, we only had two DAs. We never talked about this stuff, right? But we are now, and I think that in itself is very important. But there is a choice that is offered here. My opponent keeps telling you it's a balance. You can have everything. No, you can't have everything, right? I have very clearly from the very beginning have said, I am offering a vision where we have safety in our community, but we are holding people accountable and we're doing it humanly, we're doing it fairly, we're doing it with love, and we're doing it for the ultimate purpose of having a much safer community as we go on. And that means we think two steps ahead of every decision that we make. We're confronted right now with conflicting visions of what justice should look like. We have those who want to go back, want to bring back the way it was. And we have those who four years ago made a very conscientious decision to say, that's not what we want. We want to go forward and we want change. Change is messy. Change always brings resistance. And so what I ask is that if you still hold on to that vision, if you still believe that, Things need to be different in our criminal justice system, a system that has been in place oppressing black, brown, and poor people for hundreds of generations, that this is what we need to do. We need to stick the course because anything worth doing needs time, needs resources, need people to champion it on. But if you want to go back to tough on crime, you want to go back to punishment is the only way that we can deal with it, then my opponent is the person for you. If you want to go back to the way things were because it was comfortable that way, because we didn't have to deal with change, we didn't have to deal with some of these hard questions, then my opponent is the one for you to vote for. Deborah and, Gonzalez, I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave it there in the interest of time. Well, I'm just going to say one last thing, please, quickly, please, okay? Very quickly, because you said you were throwing time out, so just very quickly. I am asking you that when you go to vote, whether it's early or whether it's on November 5th, that when you look at us, you look at those two competing visions of what justice needs to be for our community, and that you vote accordingly. Thank you. And before we get out of here and talk to you all that she just spoke the statement again, first of all, a round of applause for both of these candidates for taking part this evening. Thanks to our host.
Paul Barnett, the CEO, and Elaine Cook out there who helped put this together for Piedmont Athens Regional Medical Center. Uh, thanks to CEH Grading making this broadcast possible on WGAU. Now, Kaki Alman Shimi, they're going to give you two and a half minutes for a closing statement. Thank you, Tim. Thank you to Piedmont. Thank you for the organizers of this debate. Most especially thank you to the people here, the people I share this community with, uh, for being here and being engaged. Um, it is absolutely a false choice to say that you have to choose between an office that can competently and effectively prosecute serious violent felony cases and an office that has the training and experience and the compassion to connect people who have some kind of substance abuse or mental health issue who have committed a nonviolent crime with the resources they need or you know, connect young folks with social resources that can help them make good decisions. Just because my opponent can't do it doesn't mean that it's not possible. It is absolutely possible, and it is the type of DA's office that this community deserves, and it's the one that we should demand when we vote in this election. Whether you vote early or you vote on November 5th, I hope that I will earn your vote. I am doing this because I have seen firsthand the incredible impact that the criminal justice system has and the crimes have on victims and also the incredible impact that can be had on criminal defendants by a system that not, is not operating correctly. When you blame the fact that you didn't indict a case for 13 months while somebody sat in jail on a low-level bond amount on a judge for not setting it for a calendar, well, things don't get calendared when you don't make any charging decision on them. That's just a fundamental misunderstanding and an effort to distract from personal failures in leading an office that does justice for all. all right, ask the people to vote for you and wrap it up. All right. <laughs> vote for me, November 5th, please. We need a chance. <laughs>